Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Simone Ferreira, Education SC Advisor and Head of the Office at Education SC Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I'm very happy to be here in a Monday afternoon with you all. And also, uh, I'm happy because we are hosting here a very good webinar. And I have the pleasure to have some important people here with us. So um, I uh, we have Stephen Patrick and Vivian Lee from Princeton University. They are from the School of Public and Inter International Affairs of Princeton University. And they also brought uh, some alumni and they'll be talking uh, with, you, with you soon. I also want to take this opportunity to uh, remember you about the Education USA Fair. We have the Education USA Fair this weekend, it's starting in Rio de Janeiro on Sunday. And then we have the fair on Tuesday in Brasilia and then on Thursday in Sao Paulo. So I hope you all can join. But anyway, I'm going to mute my mic. And once again, thank you for coming. Stephen and Vivian, thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to mute my mic. Uh, I want to ask you to introduce yourselves. Thank you again. Super, thank you so much for, for that introduction and for the opportunity uh, to present to you all tonight. So good afternoon, good evening, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Stephen Petrick, an assistant dean here at Princeton, and I'm overseeing our global outreach and admissions efforts. I've also recently take over, taken over alumni engagement, so there are lots of ways that I'm involved in, and engaged with our community. I'm an alum of our mid-career MPP program, so I'm very happy to talk about my own student experience to the extent that's relevant to anybody on the call tonight. And before Princeton, I worked at the UN and NGOs uh, across many different contexts and policy areas. So I'm also happy to talk about that experience if that's useful as well. So two themes that I really hope you hear tonight uh, is service and, so service and support. SPIA is really defined by service and support. And uh, you're gonna hear that from, from me in the admissions presentation and from our alums as well. Uh, we're really looking for students who are committed to public service and who have a demonstrated record of service, whether that's on campus, at work, in their communities, and, and that really starts in our admissions process. We're looking for that. And then once you're here, service is really the ethos around which SPIA revolves. The second major theme that I hope you're going to hear is support. Uh, you're going to hear all the ways in which we support our students. One of the most obvious is that we fully fund all of our students. So from the beginning, I want to let you know that Princeton is free. We pay 100% of tuition and fees for all students, and we also provide a generous living stipend for all students. So Princeton really is possible, affordable, accessible. I'm particularly happy to let you know we're joined by several of our alumni stars from all over Latin American region. So we have a variety of countries represented tonight who will all be kicking off this webinar talking to you about their own pathway to Princeton. I'm also joined by my colleague in admissions, Vivian uh, Slee, who's a Colombian American who has a long proud history of work in the region. So there's a lot of enthusiasm and expertise on the call tonight. And we're all delighted to have the opportunity to present Princeton to you. Uh, I just returned from a week in Brazil and Argentina, meeting with some of your colleagues, uh, and just kind of to underscore that SPIA is really keen to increase our engagement with Central and South America, and tonight is, you know, one key example of that. So basic general run of show is going to be a, an alumni section at the beginning where our SPIA alumni are talking about their pathway to Princeton. You know, they might answer kind of, you know, how did you prepare your application? Why should somebody think about spending time at Princeton? Things of this nature. We'll have time for some question and answer with alumni, and then we'll move into an admissions presentation where we're really going to walk through what we think about and look for and how you know you might think about Princeton uh, for graduate school as well. And we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So if at any point you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will do our best to answer them throughout. But we also will have these built in time for a question and answer that we'll get to throughout the presentation. So once again, thanks for being here. And I'm going to kick it off over to Francesca uh, Vidal, one of our SPIA alumni who can briefly talk about her, her pathway to Princeton to start this entire webinar off. Thanks again for being here. 
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the invite. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to see that there's interest from fellow like Latin American students in going to Princeton. Um, well, I'll tell you a little bit about my pathway to Princeton. So um, I'm an industrial engineer from Chile. I, I've always worked in public policy since I uh, graduated from, from university uh, here in Chile. And um, before grad school, I worked in public sector consulting. Um, and I was I was very interested in going to grad school, especially to a quant program. I wanted to study public policy, but with a quant focus. Um, as an engineer, I had a quant background, but I didn't have the applied side. So I wanted to know how to um, apply different quantitative methods to public policy analysis. I started looking for different programs and found like the usual universities with within those Princeton. Um, I, uh, I was also very interested in development, which as you might know, and I'm sure they'll tell you later, uh, there's an international development uh, um, track uh, in at Princeton. And I was also interested in health policy and also Princeton has uh, the MPA at Princeton has the opportunity to um, take uh, different certificates with a number of courses where you can specialize on different subjects. And one of them was health policy. So Princeton was a really good fit for my interests. And uh, while I was looking for different programs, I spoke to alums at from these different from different universities, uh, people, especially from Chile that had been to the US for grads uh, for grad uh, school. And uh, one professor from my university where I went to grad uh, for to undergrad, sorry, uh, had been to Princeton, and he told me everything about the program. How honestly, like how enthusiastic he was about the uh, being uh, going to Princeton. How happy he was with with the experience. And also, I was asking about this like support side that uh, Stephen was saying because I, I read online that the program was fully funded. I was like, is this a mistake? Like, is it real? Like, um, like, are you sure everyone that gets into a program uh, can go like that free? And he told me that, yeah, <laughs> that was true. And that's very, very, you know, how unique that is like compared to other schools, like almost everywhere, anywhere in the world, right? Um, so yeah, I just gathered information, then I applied, um, as with most schools, you, you have to write some essays, you have to, uh, you need some recommendation letters, um, during that process, I remember, I, well, I went to Princeton in, in 2017, so a little while ago, um, and so I remember that I read a lot of uh, admission blogs that different universities have, like different programs have. I, I know Princeton had one. I don't know if you still have it, but I'm, I'm sure you do. And other schools as well. And they gave you like many tips on what to focus on and what's important. And to me, the main points were just having uh, like a story, make sure that all your documents, your CV, your your essays, your the recommendation letters as well, all like tell a story and and that um make sure that it the, the people at the admissions office can see like who you are what you want to do why this program is a good fit for you why you want to go there to that specific program so make sure to do your research but and take a look at which courses you want to take why they make sense for your particular uh, like for the particular moment in your career where you are. So in my case, I told you I wanted to study quant and health. So I really looked into those courses and I remember saying on the essays, like these courses make sense for me right now. Like this is why I want to go here. I remember talking to the people that wrote the recommendation letters and also sharing this, um, this uh, side of why I really wanted to go to these programs in particular and, and just like try to stay away from like generic phrases and like this, um, you know, how sometimes people write like one essay and they just send it to all the schools. So I think it's very important to try to have a tailored application for to different schools that you're applying to. Um, 
And uh, for the recommendation letters, I also read on these blogs and just talking to people that went to uh, grad school before, I think it's very important to have uh, people that know you that are writing the letters, not have, I don't know, you maybe have like the someone like super famous or but that doesn't know you that I, I don't think that's very useful. I think the more specific, the better. And remember that people at the admissions office only have these documents to get to know you, right? So they need to be as specific and as cohesive and interesting as possible. So yeah, I went through the whole application process. Then I received the uh, admission letters. I went to Princeton for admitted day, which was really fun, really, really interesting. I, I actually, afterwards, when I was a first year MBA student, I also helped with the organization of the admitted day. Um, admitted uh, weekend actually because at Princeton you go for more than one day and that's super fun they take you out to dinner you stay with an alum with a student uh, um, you you can go to classes well I visited the school I visited other schools and um, one of the things that made me to to Princeton um, is uh, that I remember going to I think it was brunch with Dean Dean Rouse. Dean Rouse was who was the dean at that time in 2017, and she told us the what Stephen was saying right now. So he, she told us how important public sector commitment is for Princeton. That's like the spirit of the MPA program. They everyone there is committed to like serving others. Uh, all the students have a lot of experience in the field, and that was what I was looking for, like beyond the quant, the health, the other topics, like I really wanted, I, I've always worked in public policy. I work at the Ministry of Finance now. So I'm really passionate about public sector and the school had the same, like like the same motto, the same inspiration. So uh, that's what made me decide to go to Princeton. And yeah, I, I'm just to keep it short, <laughs> some, um, in my two years there, I'd say, um, yeah, someone from Chile that was a Princeton uh, when I was deciding so told me that uh, Princeton is like a boutique hotel, like compared to other other schools, and I I think that's definitely true. Like Princeton, the School of Public and International Affairs is very small compared to other schools. Um, at the MPA program, you only had like 60, 70 students compared to other schools that you have, I don't know, 200, 500 students. And at Princeton, you, this, because you're such a small class, you get the chance to talk one-on-one -on -one with all the professors, to go to office hours, all, whenever you want, like uh, there's full access to multiple courses like I remember having friends at other schools that they had to fight for their slots to be in specific classes and I was in some courses with I don't know 10 people and we had the professor all to ourselves um the same with all the guests that go to to Princeton I had I mean for coming from Chile it's very unusual <laughs> like uh it's like a different world just like how what the reality here, I don't know, I went to undergrad to the public university in Chile, so it's like a different world, but um, I don't know, I had dinner, I had lunch with multiple Nobel Prizes, and just like we were, I don't know, eight people having lunch with a very, I don't know, amazing person that was just telling, the, uh, telling us about their life stories and all the amazing things that they had done. Um, I think it's a place where you can propose a lot of things. You can make suggestions. They listen to you. The staff is, since we're so small, again, like they have time to uh, listen to you. Like we, I remember we proposed courses. We proposed uh, guests to come to Princeton. Uh, we had funding for that as well. Beyond the funding that you get to study, <laughs> you get uh funding to to bring people to go visit other places. So it's just uh, just an amazing opportunity. I absolutely recommend it. And, um, and just also beyond the school, just an amazing group of people uh, in the class. I have many close friends. I was just with a friend like a month ago from, from Princeton. Um, and yeah, so <laughs> um, just 
open to questions later. <laughs> Super, thank you so much. So we'll have Melania talk about her pathway to Princeton next. Thank you, Stephen and Vivian for organizing and for inviting me. Nice to meet you all. Um, it's great to be here and to be speaking about Princeton and learning and hearing from experiences of, of other people that have also gone through the, the SPIA process. Um, my name is Melania. I am originally from Costa Rica, but I am talking to you from Berlin where I live now. Um, I grew up in Costa Rica and did my undergrad um, uh, in engineering, and I always knew in my heart that I wanted to be a scientist. I was always passionate about exploration of space and oceans and the poles, and I followed a career in engineering and then in oceanography. Um, I did grad school in the U.S. in California. I did a master's and a Ph.D., um, and I finished the Ph.D. about 10 years ago. And I had a career as an academic. I was working in several universities, did a postdoc at Cornell and was a researcher at University of Washington as an oceanographer. And then I had a turning moment, uh, an inflection point in my life in 2015. It was the year that the Paris Agreement was signed, uh, the Agenda 2030 was agreed. And as a scientist, I was thinking, um, I was doing work in the Arctic and I was in the middle of the Arctic on a ship collecting data. And I was just fascinated thinking about who are the scientists that advise these people that make decisions like the Paris Agreement and the SDGs. And I could not think of any of the scientists in my network that were involved in that or that had access to influence those processes. And I started Googling and, and researching and trying to find out what access pathways there were for the scientific community to inform about the knowledge that we produce and influence those processes. And then I started hearing about science policy and science diplomacy, and I decided in a really um, you know, difficult step to abandon academia and abandon doing research. And I figured that I had some skills that were appropriate for the interface between being a scientist and being a decision maker, that I could serve as a translator of the science to people that are enforcing that and, and putting that knowledge into action. So for a few years, I worked as a negotiator for Costa Rica in the climate uh, delegation as a negotiator at the COP. And it was a really fascinating process, but it was confronting me with the fact that uh, the crises that we're facing, the biodiversity crisis, climate change, are not just crises of technology and technological solutions. It is not just that we don't have enough science to fix them. It is truly that uh, putting that science into action uh, requires incorporating many other dimensions, the social dimension, the economic dimension that normally a scientist is not trained in. So uh, in 2020, after being uh, very frustrated at COP25 in Madrid with a very um, you know, frustrating outcome from that COP, I decided that I needed to get proper training, that I needed to have something that truly certified me as knowing about policy. And I had friends that had been at uh, Princeton, they had attended the MPA, and they had told me about the mid-career MPP program. So this is a different program than the one that Francisca spoke about. This is a one-year intensive um, you know, year where you get to design the whole program. There's no mandatory coursework. Uh, and you get to design the, the classes over that year uh, with people that have over 10 years of experience in different areas of, uh, of the professional um, you know, life. And, and also the fact that it was supported, fully funded by the university made it the one choice that I applied to. So I didn't even look at other programs. I didn't consider other programs. Uh, I applied to Princeton at the end of 2020. Um, and I collected, as Francisca said, letters of recommendation of people that I had worked with both as a scientist and in this life as a, as a negotiator uh, that could bring about the skills that I had. I, contrary to her, I had the quantitative skills uh, down, but I really needed to complement that with um, things like, how do you do an experiment in a social setting where you cannot have a controlled environment like in science, right? How do you make decisions when there isn't just one right solution the way that there is in math or science. So I uh, I collected those uh, letters of recommendation. I did took the GRE again about 15 years after I had taken it the first time, which was very fun. 
And, um, and I wrote two essays. Um, I remember that I focused one of my essays in, uh, on that inflection point, that moment when I had this eureka moment about science diplomacy in the middle of the Arctic and how transformative it was for me to decide to abandon uh, a life in academia to go work at the intersection of science and policy. And the other essay, I focused it on uh, the person that I wanted to be, the job that I want to have after having a training, a cross cross-disciplinary training in both policy and science. And there is a very specific job at the UN, um, SDG 14, which is the SDG of the ocean, life underwater, has an ambassador. And, um, and that's the job that someday I aspire to have. So I wrote my second essay on why I could in the future hold that position and why I need the supplementary information and knowledge and training in policy to um, to serve in that in that position someday. So I have, those were the two essays that I wrote and I sent the application and you know 2020 ended and 2020 sorry 2019 ended and 2020 began and uh, with all the uncertainty that came, uh, at the beginning of that year. So we received the letter, my cohort received the letters of admission uh, in mid-March uh, of 2020. And uh, it was about one week after uh, the shutdown had uh, kicked in in Costa Rica. So it was a little bit of bittersweet moment to get accepted, which was wonderful, but at the same time, not know what was going to happen with the world. <laughs> I remember we had the first call with Steven in, in my class um, in, in the moment of a lot of uncertainty, we didn't know whether the university was going to open for the next academic year. We didn't know if the program was going to happen. And uh, there were a lot of questions, especially for the international students, whether we could even have a visa or get access to a visa to enter the U.S. Um, to go to the program. So so those first mo months of, um, of the spring of um, 2020 were uh, difficult to, you know, navigate uh, because it was on the one hand the real true excitement of getting accepted on this on the other hand to not know how this was going to play out uh, in the end we had the summer course that starts in July uh, virtual and uh, the cohort had dwindled quite a bit we lost uh, a lot of people that decided to uh, wait around one year and uh, and get accepted in 2021 uh, so we ended up with only 13 people so again what Francisco is saying about the real you know, tight knit community that becomes your your cohort was especially true in our case. We only had thirteen people that year, and uh, and after the summer course, uh, which was virtual, uh, we all moved to Princeton. But the school year was all entirely virtual. So my experience as a student was very different than I hope all of you uh, in the past and in the future could be. Uh, because even though I was living on um, on campus in a, a student accommodations. Um, it was all virtual and uh, it wasn't it wasn't only the year of the pandemic, but it was also the year of the elections, the last elections in the US. Um, it was the year of Black Lives Matter. It was the year of the Capitol uprising. So it was a year where the environment was very uh, charged. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty about a lot of things in the world, but it ended up serving as the best motivation for me to truly understand that those things that I was studying and those elements that I was learning about were not just on the paper, but these decisions and these teachings could truly change and shape the way that I could help to solve those things that I was seeing on the outside. And especially with the pandemic, um, understanding why it's important to have scientists at decision-making tables and scientists that are trained and understand uh, how to convey information how to translate information into something actionable became especially uh, powerful for me to uh, handle uh, the the workload and the you know uncertainty and the anxiety from from that year. Um, overall, I had an amazing experience. I still um, I have very close relationships with my friends from the MPP, with uh, many of the MPAs that were uh, uh, at the same time going through their program. And uh, yeah, I just have like the best uh, memories and the best, uh, you know, I treasure that time at Princeton uh, in a very special way. It transformed the way that I uh, view my professional options and my alternatives moving forward in a, in a really significant way. And I feel a lot better um, 
a lot better trained, uh, not just as a pure scientific scientist, but also as somebody who can serve at decision making tables and leadership positions, um, and has uh, a lot more broader and a more, um, uh, yeah, full uh, understanding of how decisions are are made. Thank you. Great, and over to Gaston. Uh, thank you, Stephen. So, hello, everyone. I'm Gaston Gertner. Um, I graduated from Princeton from the MPA, the two years program in 2011. So that means I got into Princeton in um, 2009 and I worked my application in uh, 2008. To put you in context, this was a time, uh, the times when uh, Obama was campaigning to for his first presidency. And so I think in all of the region and, and for all of us that care about political science and politics, it was a big time for, for, for change, you know, and the, and the yes, we can movement. Um, while I was in Argentina, before applying to Princeton, um, I graduated uh, in political science and I worked basically in government for a few years uh, at the election office. And I did a, a bunch of work in, uh, in survey research, basically running polls for um, political parties and candidates running for office at different uh, government levels in Argentina and some other countries in the region. And uh, I think at a certain stage, I reached the point in which I knew basically that I wanted to pursue graduate studies in the US. And whereas the general idea basically at that moment was, well, why don't you apply for a, for a PhD? Uh, because it's the what has more secure funding. And, uh, and I knew that I wanted to, to do a more professional and degree in the US, and, but I didn't have certain clarity that it was an MBA or MVP. And so my application was a bit uh, on, on diverse programs, mostly looking for quantitative um, curriculum in survey research, survey methodology, quantitative methods, and I ended up applying to a bunch of um, masters in public policy programs um, without knowing much about Princeton. That's that's the truth. And and at that time, it wasn't as as usual. the The previous I I looked into the directory to see who else applied from Argentina to Princeton and was part of the of the school, and it was somebody maybe like fifteen years ago. So it was an application that I did. Uh, uh, by myself without without having the opportunity to touch points with with other people and um, and uh, it it worked and I I want to state and maybe describe the process of the application very briefly with with some recommendations for for all people considering Princeton in the future basically. Um, I think Princeton does a, a great work at identifying and whenever you reach, you, you are, you are uh, admitted there, it's as if you feel everybody has been selected in a way that you are meant to be in, the right, in that, that place. As if uh, all the community, all the people that are admitted just like become a unified uh, group that is very solid, that is very uh, interesting and Right away, you kick off with 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 people that will very uh, quickly become become your friends and um, and and an environment that strikes you to improve, become better, push yourself all the time for for great things. Um, few things about the application. Um, I, I think as uh, as I, my, my colleague was from Chile was saying. Um, the personal statement is an opportunity for you to really express why you care about public service, why you care about doing an, a master's in, in, in public affairs, um, what, is, what is what you bring to Princeton in terms of your personal stories, your work experience and the degree and the challenges that you have faced. And, and I think even though you you know and you have an idea of certainty of this is what I want to become. Um, I think 
I think that part, uh, you have to leave way for Princeton to, to also kind of influence your life and just let your life be handled into ways or all the stimuli you will receive there. But I think the, the consistency is that you have that conviction and you have that, um, that interest in public service um, is, really, is really key. And same things for recommendation letters, uh, picking people that really know you, that are willing to, um, to put a good word, a very good word for you, that I have worked closely with you. And I think is also key. In my case, I, I think I, I, I ask letters for my mentor in, in, at my undergraduate studies and also my boss and somebody else who also was a professor at, at not a Princeton, but I, in the US at that, at that time. Um, I applied uh, as a Fulbright. I had a Fulbright scholarship uh, before. So I think some of the applications, I worked through the Fulbright system and some of them outside. For the case of Princeton, I on purposely worked my, my application away from the streamlined uh, standardized Fulbright process because because I really wanted to, to highlight some of the personal stuff that that could make sense and tailor my applications in which that could um, become or more uh, interesting for somebody to read it and and I think also uh, that that it worked. Um, on the second phase, I would like to say a few words about uh, why I spend time at Princeton and I think. Uh, just to build on what um, has been said recently, um, I think the, the, the academic excellence and the experience uh, that the professors and the dedication that they put into the program is something that I have never seen, never seen before, even when I, when I discuss some of these things with uh, some people from Argentina that have uh, been part in other programs. Um, I think it's it's an environment that you have to work very hard. You have to put all the best that you have in each class, in your uh, in your problem sets, in your uh, in all of your deliveries, with a combination of things that where you push yourself to work um, individually at a technical level and other ways into which you are working together as group. Uh, discussing and bringing bringing in arguments and developing this sense of putting yourself in positionings as if as you 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 are working for a government you are defending a story you are defending a position you are defending and creating um, thinking about the tactical and technical arguments for uh, for policy impact um, and I think some some other stuff is related to the that I that I also said the people. The, the community at Princeton is superb, specifically in the school, but also away from school. I think Princeton is an, is an environment also to uh, to reinvent yourself. And all of the benefits outside the school are also there for you, um, uh, joining whatever sports you are interested in, a team, or even um, I became very uh, interested in pursuing some of the program in Latin American studies that they had um, with classes and courses on the history on the political economy of Brazil and having also literature, people from the literature department. I think it's a very combined opportunity to do great stuff. Um, while I was at Princeton, I always had like this idea that I wanted to learn a language new language outside from uh, English and Portuguese, which I already spoke. And I, so I signed in for um, courses in French for the, the undergraduate program, which was also very uh, enriching for me just to live the real, the real Princeton experience with all of my technical classes at SPIA, but also being able to have classmates, freshmen and, and sophomore students that are the best of the best in the world uh, in, a, in a language training. Um, all of that, the school, the school puts tremendous uh, dedication and it really, it's not a logo or a motto when people say you are, you're welcome to bring ideas and, and it's not something uh, that they just say 
just because um, it is true that you are, you are while you are there, you are able to bring ideas, bring opportunities, suggest new courses, suggest professors, and they work. I think uh, the administration and and the deep dean listens to you, listens to what the, the, the group wants, and and they're always readapting the content, the content in this in this regard. Um, Princeton was, I always say, it was the has been the two of the most the best years of my life. It has opened uh, my life and my career to the world, and and I always recommend people to to get into to get into Princeton because um, it's a, it's the golden ticket. Um, I'm happy to uh, ask uh, answer questions with anyone. Super, thanks, Martina. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really happy to see so many prospective students from Latin America. My name is Martina. I am originally from Argentina, but I grew up in Brazil. I'm also a Brazilian and I heard from Simone that many of you maybe will be in Brasilia in the next couple of weeks. So I'm really uh, open to meet you in person, have coffee and talk further about the application. So please reach out if you are in the region. I'm happy to support and increase the number of Brazilians in, at Princeton. Uh, I am a very recent alum together with Sebas, who is also here. We have just graduated um, three months ago. It feels a long time ago, almost like a beautiful dream that we had. Now I'm back in the uh, boring working life, but I'm actually really excited with my new job. I'm working at the Inter-American Development Bank um, as a digital government consultant. Um, that is um, probably a job that Princeton um, opened the opportunity for me as they uh, funded my internship at this organization as well during the summer, which is one of the other ways that Princeton also offers support to students. Um, so I don't want to take a lot of your time. I know you have um, uh, more another institutional part of this presentation, but I just wanted to uh, encourage you to apply and actually share how I know many of you are probably very um, anxious or nervous about the application process that can feel a, very, a little bit stressful. But um, my, my main advice is to use this opportunity to zoom out from your daily jobs and think about what are you passionate about? What excites you? Why do you want to do a master? How do you think Princeton can support you to improve the and increase the impact that you can have in the world? And use this opportunity of the application process to reflect on your own career and uh, what you want to do next. So um, I just want to leave with a positive note that Princeton was a very transformative and amazing experience. And I, I really envy you right now that you are in the beginning of this process. As I said that I have already left uh, this community and I already miss them so much. So um, just encourage you to actually apply, even if you feel you have a gap in your CV or um, maybe your GPA is not the best, uh, as the other colleagues has, uh, have already said, uh, if you can tell your story and share what you are passionate about and what is your public service contribution, um, you can definitely um, fit at Princeton. And yeah, so I'll just leave my contact uh, in the chat and for Brazilians, Podem me mandar mensagem e estou à disposição. Thank you. Super. And we have one more alum who will give a brief intro and then we'll move into an admissions presentation. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Thank you, Stephen. I'll be super brief. Um, so I'm Sebastian. I'm Colombian and I also graduated very recently. Um, all I'll say is, as, as Marty was suggesting, just apply. I know it sounds very scary, but just apply. It's an amazing experience. I highly recommend it. And just one letter of, of, of advice is when thinking about your application, think of it as a whole package. Everything has to speak to each other. Your essays, your, re your recommendation letters, um, and even your CV, everything has to tell one single story. And I think that's a little bit to what Marty was saying before. How are you gonna craft that message so that when Steven and others on the admissions committee 
are taking a look at your application, they see that whole and holistic person because you are more than just your profession or your personal side. You'd want to combine both things um, because everyone else gave uh, other good advice and I know we're running into other time. I'll leave it at that. And like Marty, we'll leave my um, contact info if anyone wants to talk to me about very recent um, MPA grads. So uh, uh, that's for you, Stephen. Sure. Super, super. So I'm going to uh, share my screen, uh, just given the the time, um, we'll, we'll save the questions for the end, uh, but alumni, feel free to sort of uh, jump off. I'm going to run through some of this quite quite quickly, just uh, in in the spirit of time. But really, you know, let's get on a plane and and travel to, to Princeton. Thanks so much for joining us. So just to orient, since we're on a Zoom call and not in Princeton, this is just to give you a sense of where we're located. We're roughly midway between Philadelphia and New York, about an outside hour outside of Philly, a bit more out of New York. And what I'm going to be talking about tonight are the three degrees, the MPA, the MPP, and the PhD. So you heard a uh, majority of our alumni tonight talk about their experience with the MPA, the two-year degree, the Master in Public Affairs, where we're admitting 70 to 75 students or bringing in 70 to 75 students per year. We also have a one-year degree, the Master in Public Policy for mid-career professionals, where we're bringing in about 25 students. And then our smallest degree is the PhD. So there's around 110 or so students that we bring in each year across the three degrees. So again, because we're on Zoom, just to orient you a little bit to what, what this place is, what it looks like, so you can begin to potentially you know, uh, imagine yourself here at Princeton. So Robertson Hall is here under the orange arrow, and please excuse my horrible uh, PowerPoint animation here. But generally, everything in this first orange box is where the academics, where the classes are occurring. The lighter orange box is undergraduate housing, and the uh, darker orange circles, uh, including some a little bit further off this map, are where graduates are living. So the you know basically Princeton is a residential experience. Everybody's living, you know, working, studying, uh, engaging, building community within kind of twenty minutes of each other walk. Uh, and over here on this side of campus is going to be a lot of the uh, sporting and intramural activities. So for people who are interested in that. Robertson Hall, this is the home to SPIA. So it's a kind of an iconic building on campus. It was built by the same architect who built the former World Trade Centers in New York City. You'll see uh, a few pictures here, again, just to orient you before I go through some of the what we look for, what we think about. Um, again, just to kind of imagine what, what Princeton looks like and what Princeton might uh, be like you know, to experience as a student. The fountain is outside of Robertson Hall. There's a video here that will just give you an idea of what it looks like on any given day. It's a nice place to have lunch, to meet people for coffee, to you know do a problem set study, things of that nature. There's a number of buildings on campus. This is our chapel. It's non-denominational in, in nature, but it's a great place, you know, quiet place for reading, study, reflection, meditation, things like that. A couple uh, additional pictures of campus, <clears throat> again, just to give you a sense. This is the graduate school at Princeton. So SPIA is one of 23, excuse me, 43 graduate departments and programs at Princeton. And you can take courses across the other 42 departments and programs at Princeton. So there is a lot of ability to uh, take courses outside of SPIA as well. Um, and so here is what you're probably all here for, the graduate program. So we're going to start with the MPA, then we'll talk about the MPP, and then we'll briefly talk about the PhD. So as you'll see here on the left, the MPA, it's a two-year degree. Uh, so basically, the MPA and the MPP, you choose between one of these four fields of concentration, which is what these four orange boxes are here on the uh, bottom. And you can also further specialize your degree with three optional certificates, either in health and health policy, science, technology, and environmental policy, or urban policy. So I will do a deeper dive into each of these, but generally, you know, the degree would be an MPA, everybody, MPA or MPP, everybody is choosing a field of concentration, and some people are choosing an optional certificate to further specialize. On the PhD side, there are two clusters of study, either security studies or STEP, science, technology, and environmental policy. So the MPA, again, it's a two-year degree. You're going to see a picture of one of our most recent cohorts on the upper right here. 
It's taken over two years. There are 16 courses that are required to complete the Master in Public Affairs. So basically roughly half of your course is prescribed or described from the university. So you have the core curriculum, which you'll see here in black on the left-hand side, which is pretty quantitative in nature. As a result of that, in the MPA admissions process, we are, and some of the alumni referenced this as to why they wanted to come here, we are looking for some kind of baseline quantitative foundation in the application review process, but we recognize that you know not everybody is going to have an economics major or have taken all of these courses. So there's a variety of ways to demonstrate that kind of baseline quantitative foundation, but you'll see here that there are these quantitative courses. In addition, there's a policy workshop requirement. So this is what you would take during the fall semester of your MPA two year. What this means is you're working for a real world client. So it might be a government, it might be a multilateral institution, an NGO. You're working for a real world client on a real world issue with a group of eight to 10 other students. Uh, you basically spend the first half of the, of the term doing a deep dive into the policy area. Then you'll travel to the location during the fall break. Princeton will pay for that. And then you'll spend the second half of the term uh, doing writing writing the re, writing the policy report. Uh, a lot of people find that this is really a defining, uh, you know, capstone flagship experience of their MT, uh, of their MPA degree. Um, a couple different things that I will point out, you know, certainly since Gaston was here, but but recent additions is this race, power, and inequality course. So this largely came out of student advocacy and activism. So this is really Princeton listening to students and making sure that what we are including in our curriculum and tuition is uh, you know, relevant for, for the future. So this is the first course that all MPAs take now together. So we recognize that people are coming into SPIA with different baselines and understandings around power and structural and systemic sort of uh, issues in, in government and elsewhere. And so everybody, all MPAs are taking this course together. We also have a uh, what's now going to be called policymaking in diverse societies, which is the old diversity, equity, inclusion requirement. But this is about 25, 30 different courses that each MPA will choose from. So you'll choose a course that makes sense for your own professional development. And those are two additional sort of changes of, of late to the MPA core curriculum. Again, all MPAs will choose a field of concentration. You'll see them listed here on the orange. So we have international relations international development, domestic policy, and economics and public policy. So the degree is an MPA, everybody chooses the field of concentration and you choose that at the time of application. So the field to which you apply is the lens through which we will analyze your file. So if you're applying to you know, the international relations field, that's how we're gonna think about your file. People can change fields upon arrival, many people do, but just bear that in mind that your argument and your application is really gonna to wanna to match the field that you're applying to. Uh, we offer these courses either B-Track or C-Track. So B-Track, it's the same concepts, the same material, it's really just how it's taught. B-Track is largely algebra-based and C-Track is calculus-based. So, you know, 507, 508, 512, 511, all of these have the option of taking them the algebra-based way or the calculus-based way. If you're in fields one, two, or three, so that's international relations, international development, or domestic policy, you can take the courses either all B-Track, all C-Track, or a combination. If you're applying to the economics and public policy field, you have to take all of your core courses C-Track, which would be calculus-based. As a result, we're going to be looking for calculus in your background during the admissions process if you're applying to the economics and public policy field. There is an internship requirement between the MPA 1 and MPA 2 years. So if the organization that you're working for does not pay you, Princeton will. So we'll give you a weekly, we'll give you a weekly living stipend uh, to cover your expenses while you're on the, while you're on the internship. And then for those who want to further refine or specialize their degree, there's these three optional certificates that you'll see here on the blue. I'm talking really fast because I only recently learned this was an hour, not an hour and a half. So I'm sorry for going so quickly through this. But the next uh, is the Master in Public Policy. So the main difference here between Stephen, the MPE... We yes. can go up to one hour 15, right? We can go a bit over. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll still... Try to go so we have plenty of time for for q a i'm here as long as long as anybody has questions uh so the mpp is for mid-career professionals so you'll notice that we have no or or in our admissions process we have no quotas we have no cutoffs we have no minimums anywhere in the process except 
uh, in two places. And one of them is here in the MPP degree. So in order to apply for the mid-career degree, you have to have a minimum of seven years of full-time professional work experience before applying. Most of our students are coming with 10, 12, 15 years of experience, but in order to apply for the MPP, you have to come with at least seven. It's the same fields of concentration, the same optional certificates. The main difference here is there's no core requirements. So you'll notice on the MPA here, there's all of these core courses. So this is a policy toolkit. We think about the MPA core curriculum as a policy toolkit in quantitative analysis and decision-making that we're providing to all of our MPAs. And the MPP, by nature of where you are in your career, you really are going to have a sense, MPPs really have a sense of what they need out of graduate school, maybe where some of the gaps are. You know, Melania talked about why she wanted to come back to the MPP. After you've been doing something for a decade, you really understand kind of what it is you need out of graduate school. And so the MPP is really quite flexible in terms of what is uh, required. The only requirement is that there's a summer program which predates the academic year. And that summer program essentially does a semester of microeconomics and statistics in seven weeks in order to give people the uh, uh, prerequisite if they decide to, to take their quantitative skill uh, coursework further while they're here. Um, this is about 25 uh, students in the MPP. And then the final degree that we have is the PhD. Generally, it takes five years. Some people complete it in as short as three. There are different clusters than what you'll see on the master's in terms of concentration. So we offer a security studies cluster and a science technology and environmental policy cluster. So in the way that I'll just go back through the slides, I would really encourage people for the MPA to think about, um, you know, we're looking in the admissions process at a uh, some kind of baseline quantitative foundation. In the MPP, we're really looking at the leadership profile uh, of individuals. We're, we're really looking for people at that mid to mid senior level in their roles or in their policy lane who are ready to jump to the more senior levels in terms of decision making and responsibility. And in the PhD, we're really looking for alignment between your area of research and our faculty. So it's going to be very important that you identify a few faculty at SPIA who have uh, who are working in an area that it, that you want to want to propose working on here. You'll see some of the areas of concentration listed on this slide for each of them. Generally, for letters of recommendation, you heard a couple of the alums talk about the letters of recommendation. You know, we're looking on the master's side for one letter from an academic, one letter from a professional, and one who can really speak to your service, uh, you know, your public service profile. On the PhD side, it's going to be really important to have, you know, two, if not all of your letters come from faculty members and people who can sort of write to their peers uh, who are our faculty members on this side. So I'll leave it for there. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'll just sort of continue through the rest of the presentation for now. Here are some of the application requirements. So our application will open in early September each year. It closes December 15th. So you basically have a little less than three months to complete your application. You'll find out then your admissions decision in March. We will have an admitted students weekend in April, and you'll have to let us know of your decision by mid-April. That's the same timeline every year. So if you're not uh, ready to apply this year, it will be the same open in September, application in December, sort of every year. Uh, we'll get the list of people who are on this webinar. So whenever you choose to apply, we will waive your application fee uh, whenever. Um, if there are other people who you know who want to apply, anybody who applies before the end of October, Princeton will pay the application fee. So if you're on the webinar, apply whenever you want. If you are not on the webinar and listening to this at some other point in time, basically, as long as you apply before October 30th, we will pay your application fee. And part of that is to really think about how do we make this equitable and fair for people from all over the world, uh, and reducing that application fee is one uh, method of that. We are also accepting Duolingo this year, so you can take the TOEFL, the IELTS, or Duolingo for the English language requirement. Uh, that's a little bit more complicated. I'm happy to put the uh, link. Uh, actually, it doesn't come live till September. But if you look at the graduate school at Princeton for the English language policy, there's going to be a rubric that you'll want to trace through. So there's some ways to exempt out of that, including if your undergraduate instruction was entirely in English. Otherwise, uh, there is an English language requirement uh, for our grad, grad programs. 
you'll see sort of a um, pretty standard statement of purpose. We're really trying to understand who you are, why you want to come to Princeton. The supplemental essay really gives us a chance on the master's side to understand you in a little bit more uh, personal of a manner. Um, policy memo is something we get a lot of questions on. So when I'm done talking, I have to put the link in the in the uh, chat, but you can basically just Google pro tip Princeton SPIA policy memo and you'll find an admissions blog on how to write a policy memo. We are looking for <clears throat> sort of you uh, to take a position on a policy issue. It doesn't matter what that issue is, uh, but you need to sort of um, take a position on an issue and offer some recommendations. So you choose your policy, you're making a, a recommendation, you're sort of supporting that. Key aspect of the policy memo then is to also offer a counter argument. So sort of show us that you can think around a about a policy issue from more than one side and offer some counter arguments to your recommendation. Then you're gonna to wanna to discount those counter arguments in terms of why you didn't make that as the recommendation and ultimately then sort of uh, re-support the recommendation that you're making. The policy memo, of course, is something that we're going to teach you how to do here at Princeton, but it is just an exercise uh, to go through that will help you um, begin to acclimate and, and learn about some of the things that we're teaching you here at Princeton. Um, the blog is going to be a very good resource for that. It's not like a traditional paper. It's a little bit more like an outline with, with recommendations and, and actions. And then if you are applying for the PhD, there is a writing sample that's required up to 25 pages. It doesn't have to be published. If it is published, that's fine, but you need to be the sole author. So if you were uh, writing a paper with multiple people, you can't submit that for your writing sample. So the view book, I'll also put the sorry, link for the Sorry, Stephen, I didn't yes, get Can or can't? I said can or can't? Cannot. The, or cannot. the writing okay. sample for the G, the PhD must be, you must be the sole author. Mm -hmm. okay. The view book, in addition to our missions blog, is another really great resource. So this is also easily, you know, we can put the link in the chat on, on this session, but if you're watching the recording, you know, you'll just want to go to the graduate admissions section and look at the view book. And this is going to have a lot of information to go through as you think about preparing your application for Princeton. So there are four main buckets that uh, we think about when we are uh, bringing together the community as part of the admissions process. So the first, as we sort of have talked about and the alumni have talked about, is really this commitment to public service. So really demonstrated commitment to public service. This can be defined broadly and differently, and it's going to be different for every person. You know, it can be work in the government. It can be work at a multilateral institution. It can be an NGO. It can be volunteer. It could be, you know, something, maybe you're a teacher, and so you're interested in education policy. Whatever it is, it's really up to you to help translate that public service angle through, but it's really broad. But that commitment commitment to public service really is central to everything from the admissions process all the way on through to your time here at SPIA. We're obviously looking at the academic background. Uh, we're looking at the leadership and impact. I guess on the academic background, you know, one thing to keep in mind is context is going to be important. So maybe you had a difficult semester or a hard transition into the academic year into the uh, uh, bachelor's degree, let us know that. You know, if you were working full time, let us know that. If you uh, were, you know, a caretaker for a family, you know, that context is gonna be important. Or if you had a semester off, you know, help us understand what that gap might've been. So the context is gonna be really important on the academics. Leadership and impact, again, this is particularly important for the MPP, but it is sort of a cross. We're really looking to understand um, you know, are you a leader on campus? Are you a leader in your community? Are you a leader uh, at your place of work? And we're also looking to understand really where and how have you had impact. So we don't have a limit on your resume or CV. So if you need, you know, a few extra lines to really spell out a project or program that you worked on, please do, because we're really going to be looking to understand kind of the impact of uh, the work that you're doing. And then finally, we're really looking for diversity of perspectives. So, you know, this is really the year of Latin America at SPIA. We're really thinking deeply about how do we uh, build stronger bridges and ties to the our neighbors to the south. Uh, so the perspectives that you're going to bring from Brazil or Argentina or wherever it might be that you're joining us from is going to be different than somebody coming from India or China or California. And when we are going through our admissions process, we're really thinking about uh, bringing together a community. A lot of the learning, of course, happens from the faculty here, but you're also going to learn a lot from your classmates. And so just help us, you know, really understand who you are. 
uh, as you're putting together and bringing together your application. So we are committed to training students for careers and impact in public service. But we're also, you know, really interested in you helping us. So, so a couple of sort of three, three additional things I'll offer here is to connect the dots for us. So as I was saying, if there is a gap in your education or employment, help explain what that is. Really just sort of trace, the, trace your, your professional uh, trajectory for us and really um, help us understand kind of the motivation behind the different moves and the, the motivation behind uh, what it is that you're doing. You really want to answer why, why Princeton and why now? And what's next? So why do you want to come to Princeton? Why is this the right year? You know, why is this the right year versus, you know, two, three, four years from now? And what do you hope to do next? So you heard from a lot of the alumni in terms of what it, what they sort of talked about in their application and then what they're doing now. Uh, that's going to be really important to bring through in the application. And then it's really, it's going to be really important for you to, uh, we want to understand the people behind the paper. And so it's important for you to tell us your story and to tell us that in a way that only you can. We often get applications uh, from folks that are written, sort of, um, they're, they're sort of writing what they think we wanna hear as opposed to really just helping us understand who they are. So we're incredibly supportive community. You're gonna see a lot here on the right in terms of uh, the different student groups and organizations that we have available. Uh, so it's, it's a supportive community from the staff and the administration, from the student groups, from our faculty, many of whom that you see here, including some who have expertise uh, in, in area studies, Latin America, for example. And we also, again, have the support in terms of the tuition. So 100% of students receive 100% of tuition and required fees. And that's a full stop statement. There's no catch. There's no extra application or essay that you have to do. It's really as simple as you, you get in and you get the money. Um, you know, you heard from one of the alums, you know, just to apply. Uh, you know, the surest way to ensure you don't get admitted is to not apply. So, I mean, there is sort of that that dimension to this is to, you know, especially if we're waiving the application fee is to make sure um, that you apply to give yourself a shot. But 100% of our students receive full tuition and fees. And then in addition to that, we also offer a generous uh, living stipend. So basically, we're paying uh, graduate students to come to school. So if you're committed to dialogue and public service, I really hope that you think about applying to our school when the time is right. And I just would sort of end with this idea that Princeton is possible. You know, Princeton really is possible for hopefully a number of you on the call. Uh, I hope the alumni and their perspectives and their pathways to Princeton was useful, uh, just to give you a sense of the diversity and range of where people are coming from in terms of country and policy areas. And uh, I would just sort of, um, you know, the, the, the funding is, is, is makes Princeton affordable and it makes Princeton accessible. Uh, and, and I just wouldn't sort of, uh, I want to make sure I'm sort of emphasizing and underscoring that we have that support financially and otherwise, uh, and that we um, really work hard to build a community at the admissions, uh, at the time of admissions, and that we, um, you know, uh, are working to continue to sort of uh, build connection and community with folks after they leave campus as well. So my email is up here. I'll leave it up here for a minute, I guess, as we as we move. I see there are a number of questions in the chat or a few questions in the chat. Uh, oh, great. So it's just the um, links to the policy memo and the blog. But I'm happy to stay on for as long as needed to answer any questions if there are. Uh, questions, you can feel free to bring yourself off mute or on camera. If you're more comfortable typing it in the chat, we can do it that way as well. But thank you for, for staying on uh, and for joining us tonight. Hope that hope that I found it useful and that some of you will, will apply when the time's right. I have a question. Great presentation, by the way. Um, I'd like to know about uh, practical experience or hands-on experience that maybe uh, students, uh, they, they have uh, in and outside classroom while at Princeton. Great. So, you know, the main ways that people are, are gaining practical experience at Princeton in the MPA program would be through the policy workshop, which happens in the fall semester of your MPA two year. So this is sort of our version of a capstone, and it's really where you're working again for the real world client on a real world policy issue, whether it's, you know, Middle East peace process or migration in Africa or climate change in the Arctic, you know, whatever the topic might be, 
Uh, it varies year to year, and these are student, you know, driven in terms of the topics that we that we offer in the policy workshops. The internship is another one. So this is a required component of the MPA degree, where we, you know, fund that during the MPA one between the two years. Uh, you notice from Martina, she had the internship and now has a job at the organization that she interned for. So that's one uh, another way. Uh, we also offer, you know, we're we're well positioned between New York City and Philadelphia, and we're about three out two and a half three hours outside of Washington D.C. Uh, some people will find value in doing an internship during their degree as well, and that's possible. Nobody can intern during their first semester, but thereafter you can you can work or intern up to 10 hours per week with the approval of the Associate Dean for Graduate Education. So there are opportunities for um, people to get, to get involved with that. We've launched two new initiatives this year, one of which is SPIA in NJ or SPIA in New Jersey. And this is all about engaging with our backyard in our home state. So there's a lot of opportunities for um, practical work and volunteer within the state of New Jersey. There are some you know, communities surrounding Princeton that have a lot of policy challenges. And so there's a lot of ways that students and faculty uh, can engage within the state of New Jersey. Um, et cetera, et cetera. You know, one of the alumni mentioned just that kind of there's a lot of ways to propose what doesn't already exist at Princeton, and there's a lot of willingness to sort of listen to that and hear that. So um, there are a lot of ways to have uh, practical experience, but this is a full-time residential program where people need to be in Princeton, even during COVID. We had people during Princeton in Princeton, um, and so the, the the focus is on the academics but there are these uh, required components that are practical, and then there are the extras that people can do above that. So I there's a question here in regards to admissions. How important is the GRE uh, in the general assessment of the application? So uh, because I breezed through that, I'm very sorry, uh, but the only program that requires the GRE is the MPA. So the GRE is not accepted for the uh, MPP or the PhD. But the GRE is required for the MPA, and in part that is due to the nature, you know, the core curriculum. So there is the quantitative component to the core curriculum. And so we have found that the GRE is often something that pulls somebody into the class or brings somebody into the community rather than act as, acts as a barrier. So it might be that somebody didn't take, you know, quantitative courses in their bachelor's degree because they didn't know they needed to to be competitive for a policy degree. And so they can study for the quantitative section of the GRE, do really well, and that may be one way that somebody can demonstrate that baseline quantitative foundation. The EdUSA teams have, you know, resources for GRE study and, and can work with you on that. Um, I would say to think about that test for, for those who are applying to the MPA is one part among many. So the, the GRE is one part among the entire application file. So Princeton does individual and holistic application review, which means that we're looking at the file individually. So we're looking at you as an individual and we're thinking about you and your file holistically. And that holistic sort of review is really around the context, you know, and around the environment, uh, academic and otherwise that you're coming from. So again, in a holistic review, the, the GRE is just one part among many, and it is, it's not determinative in terms of whether somebody would get in or not. Um, so I would, you know, do your best, prepare for it, you know, all of that, but it's, it's uh, you know, often something that will bring somebody into the class rather than hold them out. And you'll see in the view book that it is, uh, I, I forget the exact pages, but by degree, it will sort of outline kind of a, an, an average over three to four years in terms of what the breakdown is domestic versus international in terms of student population. It will break down sort of what the uh, average GRE scores are by the verbal and the quantitative section. We also yeah. super score. So if you take it once and you don't like how you did, you can also take it again. Of course, we recognize that that costs money, but sometimes people take it a second time. And so if you do well on the verbal one time and well on the quant the other time, we only look at the highest scores. I, I guess the answer is no, but I will ask you uh, Do you want to say, uh, GMAT instead GRE? We don't. The only the only test that we accept is the GRE. But we are, you know, what we've and SPIA was a leader on this and at uh, at Princeton, but we really are are thinking 
uh, broadly about the policy, for example, in the English language and, and how we can sort of make that umbrella as big as possible that we can, um, you know, in terms of what we'll accept. And so we are accepting Duolingo this year, which is cheaper option and gives you the results earlier. And, and what score do you expect from Duolingo? We don't have we don't have any minimums or cutoffs mm -hmm. or quotas, uh, so we don't have guidelines out yet. They'll come out in September for the Duolingo. Uh, generally, for the TOEFL and IELTS, we're looking for overall hundred on TOEFL with twenty seven speak sub score, and uh, seven overall IELTS with an eight speak sub score. Those are guidelines. We have definitely had people admitted uh, with with less than those scores, but I would really, you know, in, put some context to that. You know, there was uh, somebody who had a lower score than that, but who had 10 years working in D.C. for the World Bank, for example. There was somebody who had lower score than that who had a very thick accent. So it was less about the comprehension uh, than, you know, the, the, the way that the test did. It just, you know, scored lower because of the, the accent on the English language. So I would use those as guidelines. Um, again, we have no minimums, we have no quotas, we have no cutoffs, but, um, you know, that is a part of, of the application. And the reason why we place so much emphasis on the speaking score is because the vast majority of our classes are seminar style. So you'll have heard from one of the alumni who was in class with 10 people. You know, it's really the hardest place in the world not to get an excellent education just by nature of the size. So you're in class sometimes with, you know, eight, 10, 12 students in the faculty member and you're around sort of seminar tables. So the expectation is that students are able to engage in conversation in these classrooms. What else? Hi, Steven. Hi, everyone. Sorry. <laughs> uh, actually, you have already answered one of my two questions. First of all, was about the cutoff of TOEFL. If I understood correctly, is 100, right? And 27 for speaking. I wouldn't think of it as a cutoff. I would think of it more as a guideline. You know, there you can still apply with less than that, but more often than not, the people who are successful have higher than that scores. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So in my last question is, is there any professor that we have to address in our statement of purpose? I mean, this is an obligation for master or this just an obligation for PhD program? Which one are you, which one are you applying to or thinking about? Actually for masters. <laughs> masters. So it's, no, it wouldn't be, you know, you don't have to list faculty member one, two, and three. If there are people at Princeton whose work you're very keen on or or who you really want to work with, then by all means okay. mention them. Uh, you know, th this, this can be part of your why Princeton. You know, we want to understand why you think this is the right place for your master's degree. And so if there are faculty here whose work you know or whose work you want to learn from, by all means include them in your application, but it's not a requirement nor is it a requirement to reach out to faculty, including for the PhD. So we don't have any sort of mechanism to link you with faculty before you're admitted. Afterwards, we're happy to sort of provide introductions to alumni and to current students and to faculty, but it's not part of our admissions process. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for answering me and helping me. And I see Milani here is ribbing me for not putting any in winter. I do have some, but I was trying to breeze through uh, very quickly. Um, there, there is snow here in Princeton. So uh, for those, <laughs> uh, so there, I have a master's in law. Uh, I would like to do an, a PhD in public policy. Um, okay, so the question is really around whether you need a master's, I guess, to apply into, um, do you need an MPP as a prerequisite? Uh, so, so, let me think about this answering in a lot of different ways. So there is the only requirement to apply to a PhD at Princeton is have a bachelor's degree. So you do not have to have a master's in law or in anything to apply to our PhD programs. You only have to have a bachelor's degree. If you already have a master's degree and you're applying for a second master's degree, it's going to be very important for you to help us understand why you need a second what will the MPA or the MPP provide that your, your prior masters did not? You know, Melania talked about it a little bit different in terms of having the, the, P, the, the technical background and wanting the policy side. She, she happened to have a PhD, but sometimes people have a master's in whatever it is and they might want the policy analysis or they might want the quantitative skills or they might want the whatever. So it's really gonna be up to you to help us understand sort of why you need that extra master's degree. It's not a prerequisite, 
Um, we think about our MPA and our MPP as terminal degrees. So we don't have huge numbers of people moving from our MPA or MPP into a PhD program. So if the goal for this question is around the PhD, then our recommendation would be to apply directly into the PhD, not to use one of the masters as a stepping stone into the PhD, if that makes sense. In Brazil, master's is a research program, not a professional program like the USA. Uh, you know, we do notice that um, sometimes there are people coming from Latin American countries who do maybe what we call four plus one or something in the United States, where they do the bachelor's degree and the master's degree kind of in one. So it's not uncommon for us to see, particularly people are applying into field four, which is our economics and public policy degree. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to see people with a bachelor's and a master's in, for example, econ, and then applying into our field four MPA degree. But again, the challenge really for anybody coming with a prior graduate degree is to help us, us being SPIA and the admissions committee, understand why you need, um, you know, the additional graduate degree. You know, really going back to that, why Princeton, why now, and what's next, you know, just kind of using those as guides throughout your file. Anything else from anyone? Do we need to have a lot of research experience or a series of published articles to apply for the MPA? Um, okay, so the question is around research experience or published articles. So the main thing for the MPA is the, you know, again, going back to this idea of uh, demonstrated commitment to public service. But that demonstrated commitment doesn't have to be via research. It can be, but it can be, you know, via work in the government or work for an NGO or volunteer. You know, that's really the driving, defining sort of thing is this demonstrated commitment to public service. If you're applying to the PhD, I would answer that differently. But this this is really uh, for the MPA. You don't have to have research experience as such, and you don't have to have published articles. If you do, by all means, tell us about them and share them. But it's not a prerequisite or a requirement in any way, shape, or form to apply for the MPA. It's really the service, the public service. Okay. Anything else? So thank you all so much and to Melania and Gaston for staying on and listening to all of that. Hopefully it all jives and vibes with what you, what you remember uh, at, at SPIA. Uh, and I had the privilege of seeing both of these uh, folks actually recently, Melania in DC and Gaston in, in uh, Buenos Aires. So just to sort of highlight that the, the community of SPIA really is strong and it, it it's worldwide and it uh, is something that's ongoing. You know, I, didn't really go into all of the uh, support we provide with career development, for example, but the career development team is available to you uh, from day one and for life. So if this is something, you know, you, you graduate from Princeton and five years later, 10 years later, you want to switch careers, you call back up the career development team and they'll help you. They'll help you with your resume or they'll help you with your, you know, interview prep or positioning you for the new job. So the, the support and the community really transcend campus. And it is something that, um, you know, is, is started here, but but it's it's something that continues long beyond when you graduate. Thank you, Stephen, Aviva, and, you know, all the alumni. You did a great presentation, and I hope uh, everyone here can apply, and also people can learn, and you also can share this information we learned here today with your colleagues, and um, that's it. Thank you so much for the lovely presentation. By the way, if you, I don't know if it's possible, but if you could share the PowerPoint with us, you know, education as advisors, maybe when we have the students in our office, we could share the presentation with them. So the, the best resources really are going to be the admissions blog and the view book. So the admissions blog has a series of pro tips, which, uh, which walk through how to write the personal statement, how to write the policy memo, uh, letters of recommendation. Those are gonna be really good resources, the admissions blog. And then the, um, the view book is also gonna basically talk through all of these themes, the commitment to service, the academics, the leadership and impact, and the um, diversity of perspectives. Mm -hmm. All the materials uh, are there. So thank you very much. Good night, everyone, and thank you for coming. Thank you all, take care.
Gracias.